Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Redeemer Lincoln Square for our Sunday worship service. My name is Graham Gerard. I serve as a campus minister with RUF International down at NYU. And whether you're here with us in person today or you're joining us on the live stream, we're so grateful that you can be with us today. Now, just a quick word for those who are on the live stream, we invite you to follow along to today's worship service by using our digital bulletin, which is linked in the video description or can be accessed by visiting RedeemerLSQ.com slash bulletin. Uh, Next, here at LSQ, we are a church that values questions and those people who ask them. And so after our service each week, we hold a time of question and response, or Q&R as we like to call it here. Now, Q&R is a time when you have the opportunity to text us your questions about the service, our church, or Christianity in general. And we take about 15 minutes, like I said, after the service to go and process those questions together. So if you do have a question, feel free to text it into the number that's on the screen behind me, on your screen at home, or in the bulletin in front of you. And again, we'll meet up after the service to go over those questions together. But now let us prepare to experience Christ Jesus in our midst. Would you please stand and join me for the call to worship? Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Well, now let us continue our time of worship this morning with songs of praise. Good morning, LSQ. Sing with us.
note for you. As you can see, the screen is sort of frozen in time there. Um, so if you do need to download the app, uh, it's RedeemerLSQ.com slash bulletin. You can access the digital bulletin that way. There should still be some paper bulletins here as well. But won't you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, your unfailing love is beyond our comprehension. Lord, we thank you for your resurrected Son who took away the stench and stain of our sin. You have credited us with a righteousness that we don't deserve. Lord, you have turned our mourning into joyful dancing. Father, thank you for never giving up on us, for pursuing us, for caring for us in each moment of our lives, for truly being God with us. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of justice, of mercy, of faithfulness, and oh yes, grace. In a world where, where everything seems to be changing constantly, day by day, we thank you, Lord, that you and your living word are a constant that we can always depend on. We worship you now for all that you are and all that you have done as we say the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I took one of our international students recently to church a few weeks back. And afterwards, he asked me, he says, why do you guys have a time of confession in your service if Jesus already came to die for our sins? Now, if you are a Christian in the room today, you might say, well, that's an easy thing to answer. But this really is a wonderful question to ask. and makes a lot of sense to ask, actually, if you are someone who is exploring Christianity. You see, there's this misconception out there that many people have from the outside about us Christians, that we're just sort of groveling around on our hands and knees, begging for forgiveness after yet another week of letting God down. But in reality, that cannot be farther from the truth. Now look, make no mistake, our sins, the way we hurt God, others, and ourselves, do hurt and grieve our God, and they should grieve us as well. But God does not need our apology to feel better about himself, or more importantly, to feel better about us. You see, God recognized that we need this gift of confession for our benefit, not his, to mold us and shape us into the image of him, which is, and he is all too happy to do just that. Now look, this is particularly for Christians in the room. I mean, we celebrated Easter just a week ago, yet so often we live as if the resurrection never happened. And so we continue to live with selfishness and we refuse to allow his grace to become real in our lives. And so God graciously gives us this reminder, which allows our confession now to start with an appropriate sense of mourning on the one hand, but end with such deep and satisfying joy. And so with this in mind, friends, would you please join me together for the prayer of confession. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you destroyed the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by our own selfishness and sin. We waste your gifts, wander from your ways, and forget your love. We overlook our neighbor and are constantly focused on ourselves. Forgive us, God of mercy, Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of an abundant life given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Now, won't you take this time in silence and humility and make this confession your own. We'll hear now these words of encouragement for all those who put their hope and faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes. Oh,
again just the voices. Hallelujah, indeed. Well, the passing of the peace is a long-standing tradition in our church, and it gives us the opportunity to greet one another regardless of our relationship as individuals who are made in Christ's image. So for a Christian, this is more than just a mere greeting or a simple hello. It's an acknowledgement of one's innate humanity that we think deserves to be addressed, as well, as well as serving as a call to unite us all despite our many differences. And so with this in mind, whether you're in person or at home, let us share the peace of Christ with one another now. LSQ kids, you're dismissed to your uh, Sunday school classes. Wow, you guys got quiet on your own. That's a, that's a first. Cool. Well, welcome back, everyone, again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. My name is Graham Gerard. As I mentioned earlier, I serve as a campus minister with RUF International down at NYU. And if you are new to LSQ, or perhaps maybe this is even your first time here, we do encourage you and invite you to fill out the Connect card that's on the back uh, of your bulletin. Should be uh, information on the screen here, as well as your screen at home. Um, Redeemer Lincoln Square is a place where we want you to be known, loved, and cared for. So we do encourage you to fill that out, and somebody from staff will reach out to you and help you get plugged into all things here uh, at LSQ. Q. Uh, if you did not receive a paper bulletin when you walked in this morning and you'd like to view the announcements or the sermon text, uh, you can do so by accessing that digital bulletin, which I've already mentioned a few times, but they really want to drive that home. Uh, it's RedeemerLSQ.com slash bulletin. And for those on the live stream, the link should be popped up on your screen uh, right now as well. Uh, a couple of quick announcements here before our sermon today. First, how many of you are interested in learning more about the Gotham Fellowship? Okay, we got a couple. How many of you know what the Gotham Fellowship is or don't know what it is? <laughs> okay, well, if you don't know, let me just give you a little bit of background on it. It's a, a nine-month learning community designed to broaden your understanding of and deepen your connection to God's redemptive work by applying theology, spiritual practices, and cultural renewal to your work, your relationships, and to this great city that we call home of New York. Um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, the Center for Faith and Work who puts on the Gotham Fellowship is going to be having an information session on Monday, April 15th about the program, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, meet Gotham leaders, and connect with other prospective fellows who might be taking this journey with you. Now, I have not taken Gotham myself. I went the seminary route, but I can tell you I probably know at least 50 people who have gone through this nine-month program, and I have not heard one person say anything that, but other than that it was absolutely life-changing. So I really do want to encourage you and commend you to go to that session and check that out and just hear for yourself and see if this might be something uh, that is right for you. So again, visit that link uh, to sign up for that on April 15th. Next, another question for you. Who enjoys cocktails and conversations, uh, alcoholic or non-alcoholic? Anybody? Okay, well, if you do, um, I guess nobody does. We're all teetotalers. Wonderful. <laughs> um, but if you do enjoy conversation and hanging out, we are having a happy hour. LSQ is putting that on on Wednesday, April 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. at Dive 75, which is located at, you guessed it, 75th Street and Columbus Avenue. Uh, they've reserved actually a side room to have that event at. So when you arrive, feel free to pick up some drinks at the bar and then come join us. And we really do hope that you will come because this is a great opportunity for you to really go deeper and really kind of let loose a little bit with your fellow um, LSQers or maybe even get to know some people for the first time. And if you're coming straight from work, feel free to invite a friend or colleague with you uh, to come join you for that special night. So again, that's April 10th, this Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. 
Uh, finally, we have one more announcement here. Please save the date on this. Um, we're going to be having our, I guess, second annual now, Redeemer Network Prayer and Praise Night on Thursday, May 30th at 7 p.m. at the Salvation Army, which is where Redeemer Downtown meets on 14th Street. I realize that's pretty far from the Upper West Side. You don't need a passport to get there, um, but it's an absolutely fantastic venue, and we're really excited about this night. So LSQ is actually going to be partnering with Downtown, East Harlem, uh, West Side, and East Side to kind of worship and pray together for the night as we, on the one hand, celebrate what God is already doing in and through the Redeemer Network of Churches, and also seeking the Lord's wisdom as we embrace our collaborative mission as a network of churches to accelerate the movement of the gospel in New York City. And so more details on how to sign up for that night will become available in the next few weeks, but please do save that night on your calendar. We really do hope that you'll be able to join us down there at the Salvation Army. Well, that is it by way of announcements. Now we'll have our scripture reading today by Alexa Kripe, followed by our teaching from Pastor Michael. reading today is from John 20, 19 through 22. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thank you. I think I have a mic stand today that works. I'm happy about that. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. Welcome again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. Over the next few weeks, what I want to do is I want to look at the ramifications of the resurrection. And the reason I want to do that is because if the resurrection really is true, then nothing is more important than actually spelling out what that means. Do we really believe this? Does this affect our lives? Do we, if this is the nature of reality, is this the way, I'm, am I aligned with the nature of this reality? Now, if you're one who does not believe in the resurrection or if you're, you have doubts or you're somewhere along that spectrum, I still think it's important for us to uh, question and ask, what do I believe and why do I believe it and do I live in line with what I say I believe? I think that's really helpful. But in our text today, what you see is that Jesus shows up post-resurrection to his friends to show them the ramifications of what the resurrection actually means. And so I want to use this passage to see what we can see. And I think there's four headings we can use. We're going to look at the fact that you're sent how you don't feel like you're sent, the ways that you're sent, and the power that sends us. I'll say it again. We're going to look at the fact that you're sent, that most people don't feel like they're sent, the ways that we're sent, and then the power that sends us. First, the fact that you're sent. Most people in modern culture would say this, that the highest calling is not that you're sent. The highest calling is for you as individuals to be able to make your own individual choices to live your life as you see fit. That's generally what the highest calling is. But I want us to just do a little, quick a thought experiment. Play that out. What would it look like if that actually came to exist? That if everybody was living their truth, that if everybody was actually living in their way, I think that's a surefire way to create a pretty awful place for everybody. Because if we're all out just for ourselves, our uh, truths are going to be in conflict with each other. Um, what I mean by that is this. Supercomputers these days uh, now can like, predict who's going to win the World Series, who's going to win the, the, um, the Super Bowl, because what they do is they play out every single scenario, millions of scenarios to find the most likely outcome. I think if we played out all the scenarios of everybody, not just in this room, but in the world, living out for themselves is a pretty awful experience. In contrast, Jesus shows up, he comes back from the dead here, and he goes to his disciples, and, and here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, you, you go live your truth. You, you stay here in this space, locked behind these doors, huddled together, focusing on yourselves. He doesn't say do that. He doesn't say, hey, go on protecting and being with yourselves. Instead, he says, I want you to go out 
to others. I am sending you out to others. Which, by the way, this is very different. A lot of uh, um, professors of religion would say that to be religious means to huddle, to stay together, to, to, to keep everybody else out. He's showing up and saying, no, I'm, I want you not to stay in, but to go out. By the way, do you also notice that Jesus doesn't wait he doesn't sort of, there's not like an incubation phase of, you know what, I'm going to send you out after you are a perfect specimen of an individual. No, he, do, he doesn't do that. He doesn't wait and say, oh, you know what, you need to first be able to understand everything and be an expert in everything to be sent out. In addition, he also doesn't say, hey, you need to know everything about me. You need to know all theological principles. I'm 100% positive that these disciples did not know the intricacies of the Trinity. Not, they did not understand it on a, on a deep level or have defined categories to be sent out. And the truth is, if that's true for them, that means that's true for us too, that we don't need any of those things necessarily to be sent out. Instead, what's cool here, if you go to our text, um, when he says, I am sending you, right, I am, I am sending you out, the verb there in Greek is the same verb that he uses about himself of saying that the Father has sent me. But even though it's the same verb, there's two different Greek tenses here. I'm gonna do a little grammar for you. The first one that I am sending you, that's in the present tense. But the fact that it says I have, the Father has sent me, that's actually in the perfect sense. And the perfect sense means, it's, it means there's a past action as an ongoing effect. And what Jesus is doing here is by, by using these two different tenses, but actually saying that they're the same verb, he's saying, actually, we have the same mission. My mission of being sent out into the world is connected to your sentness. That means that there's not two different missions here. Go back to our text, and it says, as, I have, as I've been sent, so you are being sent as well. That means God's mission, which was what? To fix and heal the world, to reconcile uh, himself to us, to repair and remake the world is actually now our mission too. We are just part of the continuation of Christ's work. That's powerful to me. That means you are not being asked to, do so, to invent something. I always, um, some people in this room are very creative. I'm not a creative person. You, you give me a blank piece of paper, I'm gonna draw a stick figure. It's not gonna look good. But you know what I can do is I can see what somebody else creates and I can actually, I can say, okay, maybe... I'll try to add my uh, little piece to this. I'll try to comment on. I'll, I'll be able to participate in, and that's what we're being asked to do here, which I think is fascinating because then that begs the question, if that's what it means to be a Christian, is that our identity? Do we see ourselves, do we associate ourselves with that view of being sent? Does, does that in, infuse our decision-making? Is that how we live? Because it should affect who we hang out with. It should affect where we live. It should affect what we do with our time and our money and our space. I think it changes actually our goals in life. Like the highest goal for most New Yorkers is this, make enough money to retire and live somewhere in a nice place, right? Might be here. But make enough money and go off and retire. This says no. The point of reality then is to be sent out into the world for the redemption and renewal and recreation of everything. My, and I'm asking myself this, is that really my goal? Is that how I see myself as being sent? Now, you're sent, point one. Point two, small problem. Most of you do not feel as if you're sent. Most of you don't feel like you are, in fact, you feel opposite, that you don't feel that way. We feel paralyzed in what to do and how to do it. In 2010, there was this 85-year-old woman who, uh, in Florida, she wanted to, to show that she loved the world. She wanted to, you know, help other people and spread that love. She, you know what she thought? She's like, hey, I'm good at drawing hearts. So she decided to spray paint hearts on sidewalks all over um, her area of Florida. Small problem, that's actually illegal to deface public property. You can't do that. So the law enforcement started trying to find her. She got whiffed of this and so she went into hiding because she was embarrassed because out of fear, eventually she turned herself in but she, she didn't know how to actually do it well. Another true story. Uh, there was, some years ago, there was a man, he was trying to fill up his, his gas tank, I think at the gas station at 96th Street and 1st Avenue. He fills up his gas tank and starts driving away, and all of a sudden, a bunch of people start running after him, yelling at him. He's kind of scared, but they start pointing to 
his car and he looks and he had forgotten to take the pump out of the gas tank. So he was driving down, the hose was trailing down off in, in the road. So he has to pull over and take out the hose and the pump and you know, slowly with shame kind of walk back to the gas station and everybody's looking at him like, you're crazy, what, what are you doing? How, you know, how dumb are you? And with that shame, he just doesn't know how to, how to talk. He doesn't know how to apologize. He's just sort of like, he comes to the gas station, kind of puts it down and kind of runs back to his car. And I know you're like, Mike, that's really detailed. How do you know that? Well, <clears throat> that person was me. <laughs> um, but I think we all have stories like that where we're not repairing the world. We're breaking it. We have stories where we, we, we're just trying to live our lives and, and, and yet we're hurting other people and, and we're hurting um, things. We feel paralyzed about how do I actually serve? How do I actually care? We feel paralyzed about where do we even start? Some of you are like, there's so many problems in this world, I don't even know where to start. Some of you are paralyzed because you're tired. You're just like, I, I can't, I'm just trying to get on from day to day right now. Some of you are, feel stuck because you're an expert in your jobs, and so you feel like, I need to be an expert in, in Christianity. I need to know all the, all the words. I need to know what to say. I don't feel that way, so I, who am I to go out and be sent? See, all, there's so many different reasons for us to feel paralyzed. We don't feel like we can. We have this shame. We're worried about the faces people will make if we actually do try to um, serve and care and love. And you know, what will happen is, is they'll look at us in a funny way and they'll say, uh, no, and we're worried about that. And so what I think is interesting, if that's you, let me just try to help you. The good news is the disciples felt the exact same way. Go look, look at verse 19. This is Easter night and in verse 19, it says, what are they doing? Are they out telling everybody about Jesus and how awesome he is? No. They're, they're huddled in their room. And it says right here, the disciples were, they were, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now, we're not told why they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, but they were afraid. And it doesn't, and what doesn't matter is this. It doesn't matter how often they hung out with Jesus. It didn't matter how many miracles that they saw. It didn't matter how many times they ate and drank with him. That was not enough to help them get over their fear and their paralysis. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is this. What is? What will be enough? What will help us to move out and be sent out? And this is where the ways we're sent out matters. All right. Point three, the ways that we're sent out. If I send you out to do a huge task, you can only do that if you're equipped and you have the resources and the means to do it well. If I say, hey, out there at Central, on Central Park West, there's an oil spill. I want you to go and fix and remake it and repair it. And you're like, all right, let's go. And I hand you a mop. You're going to be like, wait, that's not sufficient equipment. I, I, that's not enough to, 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 to handle an oil spill. So you need to be well equipped. And Jesus, in this very small passage, it's a very intense impact, he gives us five marks of what it means to be sent out. Let me go through them very quickly. Mark number one, together. Look at verse 21. It says, I am sending you. As the peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is where you, Greek is helpful because that word you is not singular, that's in the plural. That's a very important uh, distinction because if it's in the plural, because it's in the plural, it means I am sending you, but not as individuals. I'm sending you collectively out together. That means the goal of the resurrection is not to just inspire individuals to for you to figure out what to do as you see fit, it means not to stay in a holy huddle. It does, it does not mean to just protect yourselves and watch out for the big bad world out there. Instead, there's this desire that you're supposed to go off and interact with the world. Last week, during Q&R, people were asking great questions. And um, one of the questions was about Easter as a holiday. And I argued that we don't know precisely when Jesus was born. We don't know exactly when he, was, he died. But the early church, the Western early church, with their calendars, decided to put uh, Christmas time, Jesus, when he was born, at the darkest moment. So it was in winter. And they purposely put Easter in spring because there's new life when spring comes. You, things that look like they're reborn. What's going on there? It's not because that's exactly what it actually, the dates that Jesus was uh, born or when he died. And if they were inside of a holy huddle, they would just, that wouldn't matter when they would place it. But they did that because it was a way to speak to the surrounding culture. Sort of an ancient 
contextualization to say, we want to make Christianity understandable to others. And that if that's true, that means it's the same goal for us, that we are sent out together collectively, but not individually, which means you don't have to know everything because you're not being asked to know everything because you don't have to meet everybody because you're not only an individual. You're not being asked to meet every single person. You're just being asked to be sent to the people you are sent to and be conversant with them. In Hebrews chapter two, Jesus says, I am not ashamed to call you brothers. I'm not ashamed to call you brothers and sisters. That, that's, that means we're part of a family, we're part of a collective that's going out. So no one person is expected to meet everyone. And so if you feel like you don't know enough, let me just help you right now. You don't. <laughs> if you feel like there's always more to know, the good news is there is always more to know. But you don't, that's not the basis by which you can be sent, right? There's this phrase, I don't know where I got it from, but uh, I've heard it down um, over the years. There's only some hands that you can hold. You're not being asked to hold everybody's hand, but there's only some hands that you can hold, and that's what we're being called to, to hold those pe people's hands. And so I think that's, that, that's really important to know that we go together means not being called to know it all and to do it all. Uh, Reed Carpenter, who was the youth um, leader for my, my parents had this great phrase about this. He said, uh, all being sent means is one beggar telling another beggar where to find their bread. I love that phrase. It's just one, all you're being asked is be one beggar to tell the other beggar where to find the bread. That's all we needed to, be, to do, to be activated. These disciples didn't need more knowledge. They didn't need more miracles. They didn't need more stuff. All they needed was to see the risen Lord and that was enough to say, all right, I'm in, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be sent. That's first mark here. To be sent is not alone, but together. Now, mark number two, restored. When Jesus shows up, the first thing, the first word of his mouth is what? The word peace. Now, a lot of the commentaries, if you read them, there's a lot of reasons that might have been said. Maybe he was saying peace because, uh, you know, in the Bible, when angels or supernatural beings show up, that's the first thing that you have to worry about, that there's a lot of fear, so peace. Other commentaries point out that maybe it's because these individuals were ashamed of what they did, and their, they, their hearts are agitated. When Joseph in the Old Testament, when he finally reveals himself to his brothers, you know what they, they felt? The first thing they felt, they felt ashamed. They put their heads down, because that's the natural reaction when you realize, oh, I should be out right now. I do not deserve to be in this presence. And so the first word he says is peace. John Stott says for this passage, the reason why is because before we can be sent out, we have to be assured, really assured that we're actually still in with restoration. That he doesn't come to condemn but to restore. That he won't hold our failures against us. And so I like to say this, is think back to times when you've screwed up, like royally messed up, when you knew that you deserved to be out, whether it's in a, a friendship, a relationship, a job, when you knew you were out and yet somebody takes the hit, somebody pays the cost so that you get to stay in. That's what Jesus does on a cosmic level. Jesus, when he says peace in verse 19, he doesn't say, yeah, peace, but do better. He doesn't say, hey, peace, but now you owe me. In verse 20, it, it says, right after he says peace, after he said this, John is important, points out, he showed them his hands and his side. In other words, why is he showing them his hand? Because he's saying, hey, this is what I did. This, was, this is what I was willing to go through for you. And, and the natural reaction, the very next phrase is, the disciples were overjoyed. And I, I, that, I've been thinking about this all week. If I got into a, a bar fight for you, if you were, something was going on and I, I fought for you and I have all, like a black eye and cuts and wounds and I come to you and go, look at my eye, you know, look at my side, your first feeling probably will be, oh, oh that sucks, I'm sorry. Ooh, like some sort of sadness or hurt. So why is when they see Jesus' side, why wasn't that their first inclination to feel shame and go, oh, I'm so sorry, it's my fault. Instead, it says joy, Why? The only possibility is that somehow Jesus was communicating, it's okay, I wanted to do this, I was willing to do this, and it brought joy. 
because it was what he wanted to do for you. And that's what changes you. You won't be changed. I won't be changed. You won't want to be sent out if Jesus is just a concept for you. If Jesus is just an intellectual process for you. Only when you can see and touch and experience that that's when you will be able to say, this is not just in theory, but this is for me. Here's one way to make it real. Do this. Try to, in times where you have some times of silence, try to meditate and think about all the times you self-prioritize. Think about all the times that you've focused on self and were selfish and those uh, uh, things that you've either thought or done have hurt other people. What you need to say is, and yeah, guess what? And Jesus paid for that too. And Jesus paid for that too. I think a lot of people, sometimes they wake up one day and they go, I couldn't believe I did that. How could I have done that? And you're like, how do I know Jesus will forgive me? He sees all things. That means even though you didn't see what you were about to do, he already knew and paid for that. And he, was wanting, and he wanted to do that too. That brings joy. And that, in fact, the word here is overjoy, overabundance with this deep realization that you've been restored. And to the degree that you live that restoration, friends, to that degree do you have joy. Like the old hymn says, well, my accuser may roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah knoweth none. Do you live as restored individuals? Do you live restored lives? That's a mark, mark number two. All right, mark three, the Holy Spirit. In John earlier, the Holy Spirit's promised. Now here in verse 22, the Holy Spirit's given. He's, it's breathed. It's the same, pow- the same power. And the reason why, why can Jesus do this? Because the power that ra- rose him from the dead is the same power that, now that you get and is made available in a mission. So try this. Let's say I ask you to do an impossible feat. I put you in the middle of the wilderness and I say, hey, you have, it's 100 miles till uh, civilization in any di- different direction. Figure it out. And you figure it out. You know, maybe it's days or months later, you, you come out. I'd be like, wow, you have great power. There's, there's, you have great ability. That, though, will pale in comparison to this power. Because this power is the power over death. The, doubt, the, the, the power over the end of all existence. And we have that. And some of the ways that you know that you have this spirit is that you end up becoming more like Jesus over time. And responding like Jesus would. That you'd be more able to handle what? Offenses when people, you know that when that, when that person is agitating, when you uh, feel like the, the natural way to respond would be to, to lash back out. That's how you, when you start seeing that you're not, when there's pausing, when you can, when you can kind of sort of almost have an out-of-body experience looking at yourself saying, do I need to do this? How do I do this? That's fruit of the Spirit. Well, that's, that's more control. That's more patience. That's more kindness. That's more gentleness. If you can't, over time, see those changes, to see the fruit of the Spirit, then it's possible you don't have it. But equipped with the Holy Spirit means this. It's a mark of being able to be sent out because it it gives us the boldness and the wisdom and the power and the ability. You're not just going out on your own. You're going out with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's that's a a completely different set of resources that enables us to be sent. Mark 4, patience. Some commentaries point this out, that it's actually only in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit comes out in Pentecost. And a lot of commentaries are like, wait a second, did the disciples get the... Holy Spirit here or in Acts 2? Which one is it? And to reconcile it, they say, well, this was uh, more of a commissioning, but actually when you get to Acts chapter 2, that's when the Holy Spirit really came. And, I, and I'm more like, wait a second. I, I don't know if we have to actually do that. Maybe what's amazing here is that the Spirit comes right now, that the Spirit actually is here, but what's special about the Spirit is there's nothing special about it. Like right now, we're in every, this is just normal life right now, right? We're just sitting together and it's normalcy. But maybe there's something special about the non-specialness about it. Maybe that the, what's so cool about the spirit being given here is that nothing amazing happens, right? What happens right after this is they go fishing. And I think that's, that, that should be helpful for us because what that means then is that having the spirit is not always flashy, but it also means that there's some sort of patience that 
it should bring into our hearts because guess what? It means that there's nothing that's uh, flashy or glitzy that's gonna happen all of a sudden. If you get the spirit, maybe what happens is, is you go fishing. Maybe what happens is that what you think should happen doesn't happen. What, what, what this did for me as I was reading it, I was like, wait a second. This means we, if God is in for the long haul to fix and remake all things, then maybe his timing is not my timing. Maybe things won't happen as fast as I want them to happen. We need to normalize that, that God's timing is not our timing. All right, last mark, shalom. The word peace here in Greek alludes to the Hebrew word shalom, which is also peace. But peace is not, you know, um, some fuzzy-wuzzy word. Peace in Hebrew is things fixed and remade. And what's, what I love about this text is that in our passage, Jesus, when he says peace the first time, it's a way to say, hey, calm your hearts. But when he says peace the second time, he says again, peace, that peace is, is kind of being sent out. Which means that our job is to help bring peace and shalom. And if that's true, I think if it happens through the wounds of Jesus at some level, to bring shalom is going to happen through your wounds too. And if I, if I can, let me just show you real quickly in two ways. One way is this, is that serving, if you actually do do peace, if you, for the shalom of the world, it's going to be costly. It's going to cost you maybe that Netflix series you were going to watch. It's going to cost you financially. It's going to cost you time and effort. If you really do peace, it's costly. There's some level of, of disadvantaging yourself to advantage other people is what it will take to actually seek this peace. But another level, peace as a mark of being sent using our wounds means this. Somehow, whatever wounds that you've occur, uh, have, you know, um, brought into your life, whatever wounds have come into your life, God's going to use those wounds to serve others. How do I know that? Because it's when you've been laid off from your job that you can actually enter in somebody else's life that when they've been laid off in their job. It's when you've lost a parent that you can actually enter in somebody else's life where they've lost their parent. Here's the best way not to serve anyone. <laughs> Have a great, lovely life with no pain and no trauma. Because then you can't actually move into anybody else's life with their pain and their trauma. It's only th Here's what's so mysterious is the pains and traumas and hurts of your life are ways that God uses you to repair and fix the pain and trauma and hurts in everybody else's life. That's profound. And if we know that, because if, if God did that with Jesus, he can do it with us. I, I'm not smart enough, and you're not either, to know how every pain and wound that you've ever been through, how God's using it. But we know that he does. And he knows he brings shalom through it. Those are the marks. Now, last point, fine. The power that sends us out. Some of you are sitting here going, Mike, that's a great list. Wow, restored, together, shalom, spirit, patience. I just can't, I'm barely getting out of bed in the morning. I can't even balance my checkbook. I, my, my, I, you know, there's a pile of clothes in my house that's always the laundry because we do it and just, it just keeps coming up again. To do it again and again and again. We're barely getting by. How can I actually be sent out like this? And the answer is the power that sends us. In our text, it's this, it's this phrase that he breathed on us. Many of you are like, I don't want anybody's breath on me. <laughs> but I think you're missing the, the illustration here. The, the breath of God, the breath of Jesus here is, supposed to, is actually alluding to the breath of God in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when he breathes life into Adam. It's actually a, a, a profound thing to, to reflect on. Because what, what John is saying in this text is, Jesus is, like God creating Adam, Jesus is recreating you. That when Jesus says it is finished on the cross, that's not just about his work. He's saying, I am finishing the act of creation that I started at the beginning of time is actually now becoming complete when you become a new creation. And when you are a new creation, now you can be sent out and love and serve and live out this redemptive, uh, restoration-centric story. And here's how, let me give you a little, little proof, a little test. How do you know that you're actually living out this story? The answer is this. You don't have to be the main character of your story anymore. The way our, my life, I know that I, I, I'm speaking for myself, but the way modern life and my life, we always put ourselves at the center of our own stories. It's about me and my, myself and I. It's about my thoughts and my uh, needs and my issues. When you realize it's not, I don't have to center myself on myself anymore. 
and you're part of a larger, bigger narrative. That's, how, that's the beginning of being on this restoration-centric uh, story, redemptive story. That you can act, when you realize that your sins have been forgiven, that's why you can forgive. That God has offered you peace in Jesus so you can offer peace in Jesus out in the world. That, that, that changes things. That I can be curious because I have space for others Right? We have no space when, our, when we're looking at our own navels because that's all we can have the, the power and time for. Yeah, of course you can't go out and serve in love. But when you feel so full and so loved and so cared for, guess what? I can start saying, why does that person do that and how, how can I care for them? You start becoming curious about the people in your life. You're like, hey, who are you and why are you this way and what can I do and how can I meet you and how can I come into your life, both spiritually and physically? as we're supposed to care for all, holistically. Because that's the way that we change. Um, last illustration is this. After my dad died last year, I, I went on this sort of binge um, watching thing where I went through almost all the movies that I used to watch with him growing up. I just wanted to connect with uh, those movies. And um, a pattern showed up that kind of struck me I hadn't seen before. And the pattern is this. So many of our stories, particularly the popular ones, Here's the, here's the paradigm of that story. Average normal person, kind of ordinary, maybe a little awkward, ends up saving the world. Harry Potter, average kid, saves the world. Lord of the Rings, hobbits, they're halflings, they're nobodies in Middle Earth. They save the world. Uh, the movie Hook, Peter Pan's grown up. You know what? He's just an old financial advisor who goes off and has to save his kids and save the world. In 1980, there was a 1984 movie called The Last Starfighter. Alex Rogan, he's, you know, going nowhere fast. He's fixing antennas and uh, helping out around the house, and he plays video games in his free time. Turns out those video games were preparing him to be the last starfighter, to go off and save the world. And I think the reason why we love these stories, and they connect with us, and they connected with my dad, is because... There's some part of every single one of us that that desperately wants that for our lives too. Because we know we're just sort of average, normal people. But what Christianity is saying is that in Christianity, you get to actually be part of saving the world and fixing, remaking things. That we were nobodies, but now we have a hand in actually redeeming and fixing things. Here's what's cool. When you consider your Neighbors, when you're curious about them, about their physical and spiritual needs, that's you getting to be a superhero in creation. When you don't respond the way you normally would in anger, but you respond in kindness, you've just healed the world in a small way. When you actually believe in the resurrection, you get to defeat death too, because in, in all the ways around you, in your work, in your uh, in your, um, your art, the way you clean, the way you act are all small ways of being ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's what we get to do. And if you live restored lives, if you do it together, if you go out with the Holy Spirit, if you do it in patience to do the shalom, you can do that. And I guess the last question I want to ask you is, 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 that, is that you? Is that who you are? Because the, the means, the goal of life, if this is true, that means the goal of life is not to make as much money, as much as I can, and have a good life by myself. It's to be part of the happiness, create, recreation of the world. And it, it'll only work through the resurrection. Are you living resurrected lives, friends? Do you want this? It only happens when it starts in your own hearts and it moves out in the world through the person of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for, for moving in our lives by, by changing the world, by, begin, by bringing restoration and recreation to our own hearts. And, and what an amazing truth that we get to now participate in this greater story, that your story is now our story. Help us to see that we can make as much money as we want, but money doesn't buy happiness. Celebrities know that, the, 
Those who have know that. Because when you have, you realize you don't have much. Not ultimately. Help us to realize that life is found in you. And that we, even if we have no talent, we have a mission. And that mission is to serve and recreate and redeem all things. And surprisingly, whatever we have, whatever we have to offer, that's enough. I pray that that would move us, encourage us, and empower us now and always. Amen. The offering is the time for us to actively and practically put our trust in God, knowing that he provides for his people in ways that we can't imagine. So as the music plays, let us offer our hearts and gifts to the Lord. Ushers, you can come forward for a collection. Amen. You guys are amazing. 
Well, the Apostles' Creed is not only a theological statement, but it is also an act of worship. And it gives us the opportunity to proclaim out loud who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And so with this in mind, would you please stand and join me as we confess our faith together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us be a part of this church body and this, this universal church body. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to come before you now at this table. We thank you for this feast that we're about to partake in. And Lord, we thank you that this is a meal that we get to take despite maybe not having everything all together in our lives. Lord, despite the places that we look for comfort and security in this world, Lord, we know that the only thing that can really satisfy us is you and your grace. Let us approach this table, Lord, as a family together and remember who you are and what you've done for us. Help us to remember the great need that we have for this meal, to renew our vows so that we can remember your covenantal promises once again. Father, shape us into the people that you've designed us to be in light of your love and your sacrifice for us. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. And for those who are helping to distribute the elements, you can come forward at this time. Now, the Lord's Supper is a meal that allows us to look backwards and forwards at the same time. First, on the one hand, we get the chance to look back in remembrance and gratitude at these words that Jesus spoke foretelling what was about to happen to him, where his body would be broken and his blood would be poured out for us. But this somber truth that we remember actually is the very reason, and it gives us our sense of joy that we experience today. And it gives us the ability to come to this table with confidence that we will be sustained and strengthened and spiritually nourished through our faith in Jesus Christ. But as we always like to say too, it allows us to look forward to that heavenly meal that is promised to us in the future. Whereas it says in the Bible, death will be swallowed up forever and our tears will finally be wiped away. And finally, something I always like to add, this meal is not just for the strong or the people who have it all together and are Christians, but also and especially for those who are weak, for those who recognize that they need to rest on a strength that is greater than themselves. And so wherever you are at today, if you are a Christian and a baptized member of a local church, if you profess faith in Christ, then this table is most certainly for you. But if you're here today and maybe you're not a Christian or you're not quite sure what you believe, um, trust me when I say this, Redeemer LSQ could not be more grateful that you are here with us today. We would love, love, love to connect with you after the service and talk more with you. But this particular meal is specifically those for those who profess faith in Jesus Christ and are baptized members of a local church. And so if that doesn't describe you at this time, we just ask that with integrity you not partake in the meal uh, this time around and just we can take some more time and process that together. Uh, right now as we take this meal, there are resources for you in the bulletin as well as for those watching from home. They should be on your screen right now. So instead, just take this time to reflect and seek truth in your life, and we would love to connect with you and talk with you more down the road. But now let us hear our words of institution. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the gifts of God for the people of God. Well, the ushers will now be distributing the elements to you at this time at your seat, but first we will sing and then partake of this meal together as a family.
Christ poured out for you. Take and drink. Now let's stand and respond. for just a couple minutes. They're going to reset the stage, and we'll be right back in action here in just a few. Um, also, but before you leave, if you would like prayer today, if something is on your heart, we don't want you to leave without letting that off. So there will be trained men and women from our church under the orange pray signs to my uh, right and to my left here. Please do go over there. They are waiting there to pray with and for you. And if you're at home, we do have an online prayer form as well. And so if you're at home, we do want to be able to know how we can pray for you as well. So we encourage you to fill that out. Uh, coffee hour is happening downstairs after the service, so we invite you to head on down for a cup of uh, coffee and a chance to interact with some old friends and maybe even meet some new ones. But first, before we do any of those things, let us receive God's benediction. And now may the God of peace sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He who calls you his faithful, he will surely do it. Let us go forth proclaiming our Savior's death until he comes. Thanks be to God. Go in peace, everyone.